So synchronizing game components. Um, these are some ideas I've had on this problem around, around games and um, getting gaming to work or getting games to work in more modern systems. So a little bit about, well, the classic way of implementing games internally. The, we're just talking very basic structures here about it. And um, some of the problems you have that. Slightly improved classic way. And just looking at the problems, some of the problems around scalability. Like how you can get these things to scale and what the problems are. Um, I will then talk a bit about a way of solving the problem and give some examples of that, of how they work and don't work. And um, then just a little bit about, talk a little bit at the end about pro some problems to doing it this way, which you can run into if you're not careful. So it's actually very easy to run into these problems, so I'll have some examples around this. And I'll be showing some um, examples of a very simple spaceship thing I have, which if you missed the, the, Apollo, sp the Apollo spaceships, <laughs> Brian's spaceships are much more impressive than my spaceships are. <laughs> but they are much more impressive than mine are. You will see. You will see. Okay. So. so, a bit about the classic way of implementing games. How how games tend to be implemented. Let's see if I've got the right glasses on. No. So classically, what you would have, you would have one one loop. You get input into the loop. It would then run through all the objects it's managing and pr do whatever it's supposed to do with each object. And it would read and write from the state we're doing these type of things. And when it's done at the end, it would render. It would then display the changes that have been made and so on forth. Um, the rendering and the input here are, are in quotes because you had the basically the same model if you were um, in a server, in doing this in a game server. And then, of course, you wouldn't be displaying anything. You are rendering, in this case, might be sending out information to the players, saying what they should see or what's happened from their point of view. But you had this one, one loop going around. And in many ways, this was very nice. Well, it is very nice if you're still doing it. It gives you complete control of the state. The state is all yours. You are managing all by yourself. No one's going to come in there, in there and fiddle with it. You don't have any timing problems. I'm just stepping through, doing one thing at a time. Um, I can access my state. As I said, nothing's going to change while I'm doing these things because I'm the only one who's managing it. And that is very nice. Um, you do run into problems with execution time, of course. The more complex your game becomes, the more complex, more work you have to do in each, in each loop here uh, of handling your objects, and the longer time it's going to take, or the more powerful processor you're going to need to handle this. And this is irrespective of whether you're uh, running the game doing this on your machine or you're implementing a server, you run into exactly the same problems of timing. And after a while, your, game gets to, your system becomes too complex and you won't have enough time to do it in every loop you want to do. Or you might have to wait until the next generation of processors come out which are slightly faster and you can do these type of things for it. And you can see this. I mean, I used to play World of Warcraft, and you go into some cities in the wrong time, r wrong time of day, and basically everything would stop. Right? You jumped, you jump forward in five or ten second hops for you doing things because there's just so much going on in the town that the system could not could not keep up with it. It was basically unplayable. The only thing you could do was just get out of town, basically do that. And you run into the same problems. I mean, th there are things you can do. You can try and be smart here, and perhaps not process every object, every loop, but go around every other object or something like this. But you, s you will still run into this basic problem. This, another problem with this is, while it's nice, it doesn't really scale to parallel systems. I'd very much like to run this on parallel systems, but it doesn't scale properly. There are a, bit, a lot of difficulties doing this. And what's happened, or what exists now, you get a slightly improved classical way here. So I still have my central processing loop going through the objects and doing things with each object and working with the states. But I might have parallel threads. So, so I'm running on a multi-core machine. I might have parallel threads doing other specific stuff. So maybe I can, move the, I can move the graphics out of my main loop into another core and let it handle the graphics rendering. And the same thing with AI and physics. They're quite common things to move out of the, out of the main loop. So I'll do less things there in my main loop. I can move these things out, and they can run more or less in parallel. I can do a lot of smart things with here. 
And that's good, because I can now use my a few more cores of my 8-core machine or 16-core machine that I did before. Um, it still gives me complete control, because the, there's only really only one thread, only one loop here managing the state. I might be communicating with other things, they might be reading things backwards and forwards, but I'm still in control of the state, which is very nice. C control is very nice. I will still get problems with the execution time. Yes, I've now moved things out from my central loop, but I still have this central loop, which is doing most of the work. And I can't, uh, in this model, I can't move as much as I'd like out, because then I'll lose the central loop, which is what I'm after. So maybe the input and the render now I've moved out, but they're still processing all the objects going on down there. And it's only very limited parallelism. This is the number of things I can think of breaking out that I can do these things for. And some of these are important. I mean, I mean, if you look at today's well games for the last 15 years, uh, look at the look at the graphical interfaces, how much better they're getting, and how much work goes on in doing that. Anything I can move out is fine. And you have these problems. You have these systems today that do that. But it doesn't get you really very far. It does help a bit, but not as far. So, it's the, it's the scalability that's a problem. We would like to scale. So what we'd like to do is to take our simple system here, our basic system with a, th with a single loop here, single thread of execution. And yeah, by the way, this thing, uh, uh, problem with the thread of execution, I it's all about Amdahl's law, which if you go in and look, about, look read up about it, the maths, unfortunately, is very simple. And uh, even more unfortunately, the result is very depressing. So what is going to affect, if we go back one slide here, what is going to affect this system the timing of this system is the thing which takes the most time, which in this case is our central loop. I cannot make it go faster than that loop. I can move things out to try and improve it, but it still is that loop that decides it. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to get, take my system here, and I'd like to make multiple loops, of course. So why not have two loops here working on this? Then I, then I, I could halve, the, basically, with a bit of luck, I could halve the load on each one, and now the system will go twice as fast. Because now I'm spreading it out onto multiple cores and multiple parallel systems. Um, a problem with a single loop is, of course, our processes aren't getting faster today. If anything, they're getting slower. We're just getting more of them. So being able to push things onto more cores, that's the only way to make systems go faster. Whatever you're doing, this is not just gaming, this is anything, right? So I'd like to be able to do that. And I'd like to go on even a bit further. I'd like to have a, another core here. I'd like to have another core with another loop and spread things out even more and get better processing like this. The trouble is, now I'm losing control of my state. Because now, well, in this simple case, I've got, I've got three, three loops all accessing the same state and working on the same state. So now I'm losing control of it. I can't be certain on the one on the left that when, when I'm looking at something, someone else isn't fiddling with it, doing something else with it, or accessing or changing it, or someone else processing that thing. I can do that. I can lock. I can put locks around things. This is perfectly feasible. It works. But locks slow the system down, and they don't scale. The more cores you have, the more threads, concurrent threads you have working on a lock, the slower it gets. I can give you some examples afterwards of examples of this. You don't want to do that. And so the more parallelism I put in here, the worse this is going to get. Either I lose control or I'll slow things down by needing to lock. And then I have another problem. Now, after, now when I had a single loop, it was easy with synchronization because there was just one loop synchronizing. I'd run through one loop, and then I'd be done, and I could do something else or do whatever I want to. Here, I've now got three loops in this case. So now I have synchronization problems. They have to synchronize with each other to do these type of things for. And then again, that runs into more problems. Okay. What happened here? It's exactly the same. Yeah, well, no, there's a little dots at the end. Saying, yeah, I'd like more. I wouldn't just don't want my three. I'd like four. I've got, well, I want four. I want eight. I want 16. Why can't I have 16 on them? I've put an awful lot of money into buying my 16-core machine. I would like to use all my 16 cores when I'm playing my game. So, yes. Th th then the problems just get worse the more I do it. And um, 
the main probability problem is scalability, right? And the basic problem here, the way I see it, is that shared mutable state does not scale. Okay, this is what we we're doing before. We had one state, and all all the, all these uh, these loops, these threads, cores, however you want to say it, were all working on one state and working with that and accessing that mutable state. And that does not scale. When you start doing things on, on mutable data, when you start writing things in, you have to lock to make sure you get consistent data in there. It's very easy for everyone just to read and write, write however they want into the state, but then I have no guarantees of any forms of consistency, and things might, w um, when I start reading, I might get garbage out, I probably will get garbage out eventually, and these type of things work, so you need to synchronize. You need to put a lot of effort into synchronizing. And yes, as I said, you can do it. You can do locking and stuff, that works. That the problem is not that you can't do it, the problem is you can't do it efficiently. And mutable state is um, the worst. If we ran immutable state, it would be easier. It still has scalability problems, but it's easier to work with, and you can get much further with that if you have, if you have immutable data. But then we've suddenly changed the way we, we, hand, we w how we write our systems, which is another problem. So we need another way, and we still haven't solved the, the synchronization and the communication problem between the loops. Yeah, we, uh, yes, of course, we can synchronize by writing into our state, but that gets quite difficult to do that, to, do that, to, to make sure th how you synchronize that. So I have to go out and poll to see if something's changed or not. Or if it's changed, do I know it's changed properly? How can I tell if I've, how can the person writing tell I've, I've now read the thing so they can go and rewrite a new value in? not destroy the value I'm reading, et cetera. Um, and you can always be certain that you're going to run into these problems in your system. I think someone who was talking this morning about uh, once in a million occurs very often, right? So yes, it does. So how are we going to do this? We need another way to communicate and synchronize. Uh, and I say the best way to do this is through messages. You send messages between the various things to work on this thing. That's, that's, ha that's how you communicate, that's how you send data, that's how you say it's synchronized. When I'm done with something, I'll send a message to those interested and say, now I'm done, now it's your turn. And where they're then when they're done, they can now send a message saying, okay, well, we want some more now. Th th this works, and it scales as well, too. But how are we going to do it um, with the messages? We could do like Go does, or at least I've read, at least how Go say that they, sh they should do it. They're using messages for synchronization, but they're, using sh they're sharing memory for passing data. So I can write something in, then I can send a message and say, now the data's done here, and when they're done, they can send a message back saying, okay, now I've read it, and so on. And um, yeah, this works. It can be difficult to get right, because it's very easy to break it. For example, I can um, I can forget to reply and say yes. Now, now I'm done with the state. Now you can, now you can modify the state. So the process doing the modification, sitting there just waiting for it, and nothing happens. Right? I can forget to communicate. I can just some process can just go read data without out worrying about the communication, the messages, and just read stuff. And sometimes it might be okay, but there's then you have no guarantees you're getting consistent data out of it putting in as well too. And that can give you very strange results. Um, you don't have to write many words of data, many words at one time of data, um, to get real consistency problems for it. It's very easy to get garbage. I can use something like an STM, which works. Again, the problem is not, not that it doesn't work. It doesn't scale very well with mutable data, although it can scale quite well with immutable data. But now you're, okay, now we're getting other problems as well, too. So now when we, again, this is a problem of sharing of, sharing of data as well, which one says the SCM does is, now we get problems with locality of, of reference, right? Now we might have multiple threads or multiple cores sharing data, they have to access that, and they, and then the machine will get requirements of being consistent and put things on. This especially gets hard if you're doing, um, well, if you look in the cache, 
because now we've got cash coherency problems that come in here because now all the caches in some level have to be the same and the system has to do this for us. And that is not cheap. Another problem is, well, if we're running a system with um, garbage collection or mutable or memory management, we have a garbage collection problem. So now we can't just go out and garbage collect our state because then while other things are working on it, because then the gar what the garbage collector does, of course, is mutate the memory. So if someone else is not really prepared for that, we can get a lot, we can get a lot of bad things happen. So when you're doing garbage collection on shared memory, then you have to um, synchronize for it, which makes the garbage collection much more difficult. And especially if you're doing something like a game, uh, you don't want the game to stop every minute or so while it's garbage collecting. I think your users will get very depressed if you do that, which means you need a real-time garbage collector. And that's no problem. I can go look in a book and I can find a description of a number of real-time garbage collectors and they all work. But if you're doing sharing, if you've got multi-threading doing sharing, then you will have problems with consistency in the garbage collector and you have to synchronize doing the garbage collecting. So we're back to the synchronization problem again. And I would say the, the only solution that really scales uh, is pure message copying. You're sending messages, you send data over messages, and that's how you communicate data between things. Um, we don't share. We avoid sharing. And we copy data. And yes, you, uh, you have to pay the price of copying, which is not always cheap, but it gives you a lot of other benefits as well too. You're not sharing. There's no, no, it cuts down the need for synchronization, which if you're really smart, you can almost get it, almost do, do, do the message copying without synchronizing. It can be done, or very limited synchronizing. I don't have the problem of having global garbage collection, because at least on each, on each um, thread, I'll, uh, it will have its own memory, so it can quite happily garbage collect that without having to synchronize anything else. There are a lot of benefits doing this. I get better locality of memory because everything the thread has, it's, it's in one little block of memory and it's just working on that. I'll get better locality, which improves everything. I'll get better cache, um, usage of the cache because I won't be sharing cache, say, between threads or between cores. There'll be, each one will have its own. So I'd say this is a very good way of making something that scales. So, um, my solution here is go fully parallel. Don't, don't, don't try to go half step, go to halfway forward. Go fully, go fully parallel, pay the price, and run everything in processes. So, what do I mean by process in this sense? I'm not necessarily talking about operating system processes here. I'm process, talking about processes in the sense that they're, they're isolated things, they're running on their own, they're, they have their own thread of execution, their own memory and things like this, and they're isolated. And whether these are operating system processes or green processes, whatever you want to call them, in that's this sense, that is irrelevant. Um, and we communicate and synchronize with messages. That's how we send data, that's how we synchronize for it. This works. Okay, we still need some form of central state. The thing is we have to try and do here is to try and minimize that as much as possible because central state is a problem and we can do smart things with it, but if we can cut it, the more we can cut it down, the smarter it is, the, more we can, the less work we have to do to, to, to manage this uh, state. And this scales quite well, to be honest. Um, it can scale very well, and your problem, what limits the scaling, is your shared mutable data. You do need it occasionally, you can't get around it. I mean, I, I, ha I have one system, which is, there might be many processes, but they're working together, so they need to share some things, and it's the shared mutable state that limits the scaling of it. This is where you get problems like synchronization, you get problems with locks and stuff like this in it. This, this is what limits it. And it has another benefit here which is, I think is interesting, I like implementing languages, so I th find this very interesting here, is that the processes are isolated. They communicate with other processes by sending messages backwards and forwards. 
So in one sense, what goes on inside one process is completely irrelevant to what goes on in another process because all it sees is the messages being sent backwards and forwards. Which means it's quite nice, I can implement processes in different languages. I don't have to implement everything in one language, I can implement the processes in different languages, maybe depending on who's written them, uh, what they're doing, and this type of thing forward as well too. It's the only way they interface with other processes is through the communication, through the messages. So th what, what goes on in a process is really uninteresting for other processes, just as long as the messages are right. So if I do a message, messaging scheme which can talk to multiple languages, I can implement things in multiple languages. And this can be quite nice because some things, of course, much better, say, written in C++. If I'm doing the graphics, I'd much prefer to write that in C++ in, than in, say, Erlang, unfortunately. But um, other things, logic, you, the lo AI game logic, you might want to write, write another language. And doing it this way is quite easy to do that interface to it because the interface is through the messages. So now I have a little example. I'm going to bore you with. These are my spaceships. Okay. Uh, as I said, Brian's was much nicer. I've got many of them. That's the only difference here. So I've got many spaceships here. And I'm using Erlang to implement this, but this is, in one sense, not Erlang specific as such. You could do this in basically any, any language you care to write the underlying system in. And we do communication using messages. Um, this example, it's very simple. It has a very limited uh, shared state. And in this case, uh, it's spaceships going around in space and going through, passing through sectors. And I can ask a sector which spaceships are in you, do you have in your sector. And that is the only shared state. Actually, it's also managed by a process. So I'm accessing my shared state by sending a request to a process. So I'm not actually sharing the state between the processes. There's only one process managing this state. So wh when I want to know who's in which sector, I'll ask a process to do this as well, too. Um, the simple logic, the ship logic here, I'll show some examples, is written in Lua, so which is quite nice, not quite nice little language. Um, some of it's written in Erlang. And everything behaves like processes. Everything behaves like processes and all communications through messages. So when you get input from, s input from the outside, from the user, from outside, that's by messages being sent to various processes. Um, when you want to communicate with the outside world, for example, there is a process which manages the display and you communicate by doing that by sending messages to that display process. So basically, as we'll see an example here, just telling, telling the display, what, what am I and where am I? And then the display handles that. And the same thing, well, I don't have sound, but if I had sound here, well, I'd be managing the sound in exactly the, same, exactly the same way there'd be a sound server. You send messages to the sound server telling it to display. So you end up with a system that looks something like this, right? So I've got a big bunch of ships here in the middle, and they're all separate processes running through here. Now, they, of course, can communicate with each other by sending messages, which are the green messages here. They're getting input from the left here being sent into the various ships about what's going on, and the ships processes those inputs. When a ship needs to access state, for example, it will send requests, messages across the state telling me, give me this, tell me, in, the, in this case, uh, which ships are in this sector. And the state will reply by sending a message back. We're sending things to output down here by um, sending messages to the output devices. I've only got one here, but you have multiple ones, of course, depending on what you're doing. If we're talking server here, of course, the output would, would in this case, would be sending messages out to the client machines running on our server. So from our point of view, it's exactly the same thing. That's what output is, right? We're telling the world what, what's going on in our system here, and the logic is going on here. And the same thing if we're running on a server input, in this case, wouldn't be um, from our keyboard or from our mouse or whatever. It would be coming in from the outside world with the information and messages saying what's going on in the outside world. This guy has now pulled his sword and started hacking, for example. Right. Getting back to Warcraft. So, yeah, I have a little demo of this working, and I'll just show some examples of this as well, too. Right. So, yes. Now we'll have to see if this goes. So I'll just start up the system, and I'll show, so show some ships 
And I can also show we can um, change code on the ships on the fly, which in this case becomes very simple because each ship is its own little state. So I can change things for, for one ship without affecting any other ship. And I'll show some interacting ships as well. So let's see how this goes, shall we? Um, yeah, now we'll start this one up. Where are we? There. Run, and we're going to do this. Whoa, what happened now? Typical. Ah. Sorry. Now we'll do it. Yes, now we're running. Okay, now we'll start up the system here. I don't know how big the screen is. We'll see. We can make it a bit bigger if necessary. And we'll run a thousand ships on it. And then we will. How, how big does this become? Ah, we've got, we've got to run much bigger. Sorry. We'll run it bigger. That's a bit better. That's a bit better. So this is our world. We, the ship's actually all up, up and created now, but now we can just start the clock. We'll set it 75. So yeah. So now we've got we've got how many ships do I start? We have a thousand ships running around. Okay. And yes, as I said, they're very simple ships. I'm not really into graphics, okay. So yes. <laughs> Before. But there are a thousand ships, and these are these are very simple. Um, what I think we can do. I think I'll move this over here as well. Do you think I dare duplicate? Yeah, do I dare do that? We'll have a go. If it crashes, I'll just restart it again. We'll see here at this place. Um, we can mirror. That's what I said. Where do I do that? Show mirroring. I don't see anything for mirroring here. Oh, arrangement. Mirror displays. Okay, here we go. Now we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's better. We'll go back afterwards. Um, where is it? Display there. Well, yes, that was tiny. Okay, so the, the, the screen over on the right here, that's where I'm controlling the system. So I've now, now started up on a 500 by 500 universe. I've started up a 1,000 ships, and they're just running around. And these are just running. Um, they're very simple. They're running in a straight line. When they get to the edge of the universe, they just bounce and come back again. Right. So we're not, we're not doing anything special here. Um, but even they, they, they are displaying here. So if we go back here and see if we can, can we see that? Can we see the editor at all? Is it visible? Yeah, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So for example, here, if you look at where the cursor is, this is where, th this, is where this ship process is talking with the, with the world. They're not getting any input, so these are very simple here. They're just calling the universe to, t to say where they are. So when a ship moves from one sector to another, it calls universe rem sector to say I'm no longer in this sector, and it calls universe add sector to say I'm now, I'm now in this sector. So that, that's, 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 how the sh that's how the ship is telling the world uh, where it is. And that's just sending messages across to the universe, to the universe server there. And it's th doing a display here, sending a display message to the display server saying which type of ship it is, which color it is, and where it is. And then it's the display doing the dots. Um, this is all very interesting as well because uh, the clock tick for the ship has got nothing to do with the clock tick for the display. I don't have to worry about my ship being processed fast enough for the display because the display will just go in every tick it's doing, which is every 20 milliseconds, and just writing out what it has. So every time I make a change in, the next time the display comes around, it'll show it. The clock ticks now, they were the 75, they're, 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 they're every 75 milliseconds for the ship clock ticks. So now we've decoupled these by sending the messages to them. And if a ship moves very slowly, does something very complex, well, it'll send fewer display messages. It'll take longer time to change. So we can do things. We can do fun things here. We can, um, we can change the type of ships on the run here. 
we can say type ships, and we will make a run ship, which has different logic, and we will set um, 500 of these to run ships. And if you look here now, if you can, can you see that some ships are becoming green. They are now run ships, and they're, they're still not co communicating with the outside world, but they're changing their logic, so now instead of just going in straight lines and bouncing, they, when they get closer to the edge of the universe, they're going around, and they'll start going around in a circle for it. Okay, that's doing that. This is just the logic for it. Other, it's just how they move, right? There's nothing strange here for doing these things. And again, each ship is one process. You can also see the load down here on the machine if you look to right, right down on the, on the right here. We can do some more. We can, we can make some ships that um, actually interact with the outside world. These are a bit difficult to see the first crop, but we will, we will sew these. So we're setting, we'll set the ships, and we will set to timid ship. We'll set 200 of these, I think. So we'll go 501 to 700. That should be right, yes. So now, if we see some ships turning yellow, now they're getting difficult to see. They're timid ships, right? So what happens is they're still moving in their straight line, but if they see another ship in front of them, very close by, they get scared, they go yellow, and they turn the other way. And they keep going the other way until they hit the edge of the universe, which in this case, they, um, when they do get that far, they turn white and go back up again and keep going. So th this is just a very simple example of a timid ship. And this is the f so the green ships aren't interacting with the outside world. The timid ships are. They're going out and checking for it. And they do this very simply by, wait, we go here. And we have timid. So here. So this is, what, this, is what, this is how they're doing it. They're saying, OK. They'll go out again where the cursor is. They will say, um, I'm, I'm going to sectors. I'm going to the sector in NX and NY, and it's asking, is there any ship there? That's just what it's saying. I mean, th this is, sorry if I haven't said this, but for those who haven't seen this is Lua. So the ship's logic is programmed in Lua. The, Alan, the system is running Alang, the ship logic is in Lua, and this is just asking, is there anything in that sector? Uh, is there any ship in that sector? I don't care what it is, just asking what it is, right? If there is one there. If there isn't, nothing will happen. If there is, I, I turn the yellow, I turn yellow and I just flip direction. So DX, DY is which direction I'm going, X and Y is where I am. Right? So I just change direction. I still have the same thing at the top of the bouncing, which, for example, um, looks like this. This is the bounce. Very si all this code is very simple. There's nothing complex here in the code. Um, so it's just checking if, if I just check where I am, where I'm, how far I'm going. If I'm in a new sector, the valid X, valid Y just checks if this is a valid universe sector. If it isn't, I just flip directions. So yeah, that's that. So yeah, okay. So we've got some interaction. Now this is a game, okay? And the most important thing about games, you have to kill things. We're not talking about gambling games here. We're talking about computer games where you kill things, right? Even Tetris, you kill things, sectors if they work. Right? So, so we will set the ships now to attack ships. Uh, sorry, get it correct. So we'll make attack ship. So now these are going to start interacting. So we'll set we'll set we'll set the last nine hundred ships. We'll set last one hundred ships. Um, sorry, five hundred one to to be attack ships, right? Now they're going red, and what an attack ship does is it's moving in a straight line. If, if, if another ship is in the sector in front of it, it kills it. It zaps it, and those little yellow things popping up, they're explosions. Okay, I'm not graphics, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't do graphics. <laughs> so, we're we, so the red ships are going around and killing things. They'll kill other red ships as well. We're pretty indiscriminate. This is, we'll kill anything that's in front of us. And what we see on the side here is that, well, we see the sound, so when a ship dies, it goes boom. I don't have a sound server. Well, I have a sound server, it just writes boom, and then we'll see later when the ship dies. So what happens is it goes boom, then 15 seconds later, the ship dies. And if you could follow these things, so now, now we see it's going, going down. We also see the loads decreasing there. Right? So we have these interactions. And the zap ships, they're also very, the attack ships are also very simple here. And this is the zap. This is the zap ship function 
inside the attack ship code. So it just, just checks where we are. Um, if, it's, if it finds something in the same sector, which is not ourselves, uh, before I put the, f the second check in there, it would kill itself. Um, it zaps it, and then it goes and looks in front. Is it in the sector in front or on to the left or the right? It kills it. If it's what another level does that, it zaps it as well too. So this is what zapping ships. And it just goes in and asks the universe, is there anything in there? What's in there? If there's anything there, it kills it. Uh, if there's not, nothing, it does it there. So the whole thing is very, very simple. The zapping is just sending a message to that ship saying you're, you're, you've been zapped. Then the ship will receive that, and depending on type of ship, it will decide to die or not. In this case, everything dies. Well, I think Alan's right. We're, we're indiscriminate here. So yeah, it just keeps on going. And if we now go back to the talk a bit. So yeah, so this is just showing this, this actually works for it. So this is the demo for, and I don't, okay, yes, I, I could show you one of these ships in Alang as well too. So I could run one of these ships in Alang for it. It just interacts because it's just interacting through the messaging, messaging so there's no problems doing that. Um, yeah, we saw the attack ship communication, and we saw that we're sending output messages for the video and the sounds. Everything goes through the messaging. There is, in that sense, there is no real central data. Even the universe is actually sending a request to a process saying, tell, tell, me, tell me what's there, and we'll send it back, and it's managing it. Um, yeah, this is great. It works. However, everything's not rosy here. And there are some traditional things that cause problems. Um, amongst other things, synchronous communication. That is a real killer. You cannot do synchronous communication in these type of systems. It just doesn't work. You, can, you cannot go out and ask something and sit and wait for a reply because what you might be asking might be blocking and doing something else wrong. It blocks the caller. So everything here has to be non-blocking. I've just got a final simple example to show that as well too. It's um, depressingly simple. So we'll go back, we'll stop the system here, and we'll restart it. And we'll do our, what did we take, 500 by 1,000. This is just saying I'm starting a universe that's 500 by 500 sectors big, and I'm putting 1,000 ships in it. That's what this is doing. And now, now I'm just starting the clock here. We can probably, we can bump up the clock if we want to. We'll say we'll tick it every 50 milliseconds, except for, except for every 100. And now things move much faster. If you look here. So yeah, synchronous communication. So now we will type these ships and we will call them a flock ship. Now what a flock ship is trying to do is to find other ships around it and try and move in a flock, like a flock of birds. Okay. So we will set all these to flock. Let me try this many form, we'll see what happens. And when a flock ship tries to go, it finds other things, it goes green, right? So it first starts off brown, and then it goes green when it finds other things, and it starts requesting other things, other ships for it. And, um, yeah. <laughs> if, if you were to look at the stack trace of all these 1,000 processes, they're all waiting for, a, 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 they've sent out a request, and they're waiting for a reply. <laughs> and it goes depressingly fast for everything to block. Okay. <laughs> So yes, this is just to sh show that um, synchronous commu communication is really a killer. I'll just show the very simple code that does this. Uh, there's a flock ship. No, do I have one? No, wait, sorry. And we will go down here and here. That's the problem. Because it goes out and looks, it does it have any ship in front in the sectors in front of it? If it does, it tries to ask it, um, get your position. Give me your position and give me your speed. And of course, the chances are that ship's already discovered me and it's asking me exactly the same thing, so I'm just sitting here waiting for each other, or they're waiting for everything. And as we saw on the ship, it, it goes depressingly fast, right? So, yes, this, we don't have time, do we? Can I run one more demo? Yeah, we'll do a quickie. And you can take questions while it's running. So yeah, um, so we'll just start this up again. And I just want to show one thing that this actually does scale, right? So we'll start our 500 again. And 
and we'll just run the ships. We'll just start. The, we'll just do start run here, and we'll start 75, and we'll just run it. Now I just want to show this. This is this is a bit of alling, but this is nothing really. Um, in this sense, it's got nothing to do with what we're doing here. So we can we can start up on alling. Minus s name ops. And I can start up something in Allen called Observer to look at systems. And that should work, yes. We pop this up. Hopefully it won't crash. Um, and now I can look here. I want to look at, well, this is, I want to look at this node, the node which is running the, the, the simulator here. So now I'm looking at th this node here. Amongst other things, we can see we're running 1,045 processes there, the, the, the memory. But it also has, poss poss it has a facility to look at dynamic load charts. So we can see the load on the system here. And this is an eight-core machine, so it's running eight or what Alan calls schedulers. Okay. And it's trying to keep the load balanced. We can see the machine, how it goes, and things like this board as well. Um, so now we're running on eight. But let's see if I can find that screen. Where was it? This one, that's the one I want. I can never remember these. One of the things you can do in the uh, quite a lot, w very well in the Alang system is control the system while it's running. So this this is our, this is our sort of a, um, the ad time for Alang. Okay, so now we're doing a bit of mar Alang marketing here. Uh, no, didn't I do that? Sorry. Bump, bump. So what I can tell the system now is not to use all the cores it's, it's got, but to use four of them at the moment. And if we go back and look here, we will see that, well, four of them have now been turned off, and now everything's moved over to the other four, to the remaining four. The load's still about the same. We haven't affected the major load, but we've moved things over. So, yes, we are scaling. We are scaling for it. We can drop it even further um, we c if we want to do this. We can do, whoops. There we go. We can do two. So now I can put it to two nodes, to two cores here. So we are scaling. We're actually moving processes among, uh, among these cores now for it. We're scaling. And the whole system keeps on going. And if you notice, that nothing happened in the system while I was moving things around. Right? That's the benefit of the Alang, uh, Alang system. This is the benefit of the fact that I, I am scalable now for it. And I can go back. We can go back to eight. And we will just see what happens now. And we'll, then we're done. So if we go up, now, now we'll see it's going to move things over to eight for it because of scaling. So things are just moving between the cores. So yes, this way of building the systems is scalable. It does work. I don't have more than eight, well, four, four cores in my machine, so I can't show you more, but I could otherwise. So it actually does work. This way of doing it works. And this, this is sort of an Alang detail for it, but the basic idea is, is actually Alang independent if you don't want to use Alang for it. If I now start to run attack ships and started killing things here, we'd see the load would be going down because the number of ships are dying and the process are dying and the lo total load's going down, whether I move them or if I don't. So that's about it. So we'll just wind up the final slide and we're done. Yeah. So yes, everything, you have to be slightly careful what you're doing here. It doing it this type of way changes the way you work things, and from amongst other things, you cannot. You have to be very careful when you're doing synchronous communication. After a while, it becomes completely natural to do this, but it's a way of rethinking. It's very easy to make things block. As I said, that that code I showed you, those three lines, were very innocuous, but they're the ones that blocked the whole system because that's what they were doing. For it. And this was the final one. Yeah, the Allen concurrency model scales, and that's me. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Or do we have time? I don't, I don't know if we have questions, um, time for questions, but maybe if, if we just keep asking until they kick us out, then we can, we'll do that. <laughs> any super fast question? Okay. Is that real lure or your... What do you mean real lure? Lure in lure. In lure. I mean, lure as lure. Or was it no, your Erlang lure? That's my, that's my implementation of lure in Erlang. So was, was that cheating with the concurrency? Because you weren't actually talking to lure. You were <laughs> well, talking to lure would become more difficult in that sense. So now, what, what, this is an implementation I have of lure in Erlang. It's called lure. It's on GitHub, like everything else. Um, and... 
it, so every, every process here was a small Lua machine running Lua. So the code, the code was real Lua. But, it, but it's, it's running in, a, in Alang Pro. Well, it is real Lua. It's Lua code. You could, you could load that into a Lua system. Yes. Well, it, y yes, I could talk to, I, I, could, I could have an interface which talks to external Lua, Lua systems running those and doing the same code. No, no, no. It, 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 uses, it uses the underlying processes perfectly, right? You could talk, you could have a, you could ha you, instead of having your state could be a, a number of Lua machines and you're sending a request over to Lua and asking it, do this for me and then give, give me back a value. That would work just as well. I just found this much easier to do. For, yes. So. Okay, thank you. One last question that yeah. is not from Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, Joe, I was thinking of doing one in Prologue as well, too. Um, just my general critique um, of the, so I, I think there's, I think there was a, a nuanced point there about uh, the state management because uh, you said at one point, like, you send messages to yep. read and write to the state, right? So now the problem that existed in a single node with shared memory, now you're serializing messages at an actor that's doing state management, right? So I'm wondering, <clears throat> in the model where you have shared mutable state that cores are accessing, sometimes you can actually read that state, right? Like, if, if you know that some portion of the state is not going to be modified, you can do read-only access to that without locking. Yeah. Where in the model where you have to send messages and wait for a reply, uh, you're, if you use something like the gen server abstraction in Erlang, you're essentially serializing your reads with your writes. And maybe certain game applications actually don't need that consistency criteria. <coughs> That's, yeah. Well, I mean, um, yes. So in this sense, I've, this demo is very pure. Um, in that it, it, it always sends messages. So there's nothing stopping you. If, if you know you have static data, I mean, for example, you've got um, um, graphical data you're going to be using it the whole time, Th then, there, then you could put that in some central place where you're accessing it. But then, then you're sharing immutable data, and that, that's much easier. It's still problematic in some ways, but it's much easier. It's the shared mutable data. Also, most of the state here of the ships was in each ship itself. So the only shared data was the universe saying, I could ask it which ships are in, it, in this sector, and saying, I'm now here, I'm now, I'm not, now no longer here. That's the only shared state in the, uh, the whole system for it. But yes, if you've got shared static data, if you have static data, yes, you could share it. Depending on how you do it, different ways of doing that. So in this sense, I'm being very pure.